in the city of Budapest. IMF agent Hanaway is running away from a group of criminals for stealing a file containing Russian nuclear launch codes. After shooting all of them and running off a roof, he comes across Morau, who kills him before he can see the alarm on his phone saying she's an assassin. With Hanaway dead, Morau easily takes the file and escapes. Meanwhile, in a Moscow prison, IMF agents Benji and Carter prepare a plan to rescue fellow agent Ethan from the van. Benji hacks into the prison system to open the cells and free the prisoners, who begin rioting and beating up the officers. Once Carter reaches the right spot in the sewers, Benji plays a song that signals to Ethan that they're ready to pick him up. However, instead of going through the easy back door that Benji has opened for him, Ethan jumps into the fight to rescue a prisoner called Bogdan. It's hard to get through all the angry criminals. But Ethan is a very skilled fighter and manages to push through and take Bogdan to an empty room while Benji locks the door behind them so they can't be followed. In this room, Carter uses an explosive to open a hole in the ground that will allow them to escape through the sewers. The team gets away in the van and Ethan explains he's brought Bogdan along because he sold him intel. And leaving him inside would have equaled death. The agency sends a group of sweepers that will protect Bogdan. So after they move him into another van, Carter begins explaining the next mission. It turns out Hanaway had been working with Benji and Carter. But Carter got intercepted on the train. But Hanaway managed to steal the file anyway. And that's when the chase began. But what the agency didn't know was that the person picking up the file was the deadly assassin, Morau. By the time Carter shook off the thugs and reached Hanaway, it was too late. The mission now will be to recover that file. And Ethan may have an idea of where it's going. The IMF agency has been looking for an extremist codenamed Cobalt, who is eager to do some nuclear bombing and has worked with Morau before. The van stops so Ethan can contact the agency. And he's told that Cobalt's real identity seems to be part of the Russian intel strategist. To fully learn who he is and where they may find him, Ethan will have to infiltrate the Kremlin and find Cobalt's file before he can destroy it. Moments later, Ethan and Benji dress up as Russian generals to enter the Kremlin while Carter pretends to be a tourist in order to guide a balloon that drops a special artifact inside the building's chimney. This artifact messes with the system, especially the scanner at the entrance, in order for Ethan's and Benji's fake IDs to be read as real. Once they're inside, Ethan and Benji reach the floor where the archive room is and use a special screen that simulates the wall to hide behind it, so they can reach the right door without being noticed by the guard. However, when Ethan puts his hands on the cabinets, he discovers all the discs have already been emptied. At that moment, Cobalt appears on another floor and, after killing a guard, he intercepts the team's frequency, pretending to be with them and announcing it's time to detonate. The message also reaches the guards, who immediately jump into action, causing Ethan and Benji to abort the mission in separate. Fortunately, the uniforms allow them to not be suspected yet so Ethan manages to make it outside after passing by Cobalt without knowing it's him. Once outside, Ethan gets rid of the fake mustache and turns around the jacket to look like another tourist. He also sees Cobalt again. And this time, he starts getting suspicious because he notices the man has, for some reason, hidden his suitcase inside a bag. Ethan wants to chase him. But suddenly, the Kremlin explodes and he's knocked out. Hours later, Ethan wakes up in the hospital, handcuffed to a bed. He's approached by police officer Sidorov, who has discovered Ethan's double jacket and blames him for the explosion. At that moment, a nurse takes Ethan to a room and leaves his file on the bed. Ethan takes advantage of this by stealing the clip and using it to lockpick the handcuff, which allows him to escape through the window. Sidorov finds him and dares him to jump, but instead, Ethan uses his belt to slide down an electric wire and land on top of a van making it crash. Sidorov tries to go after him, but Ethan is already running away. He steals a jacket, shoes, and a phone that he uses to contact the agency, requesting to be picked up. The news of the explosion is appearing on TV all over the world, and cryptographer Lysenker is worried that this may get him in trouble. As soon as he sees the report, he asks his wife to pack her and their son's things for a vacation. But it's already too late. Cobalt and his right-hand man, Mercenary Wistrom, are in his house, threatening to kill the family if Lysenker doesn't help them. In the evening, Ethan is finally picked up by an agency car. He gets to speak with the secretary, who has brought along intelligence analyst Brandt to inform Ethan of what's going on. Russia blames the USA for the explosion. Hence, the American government has initiated the Ghost Protocol, which means they've disavowed the IMF. Ethan describes Cobalt and even draws a quick portrait of him, 
allowing Brandt to recognize him as Kurt Hendricks, a Russian strategist who seeks to start a nuclear war and was asked to resign because he's crazy. Unfortunately, they can't inform the Russian government of this because Americans have lost all credibility. The secretary is supposed to take Ethan back to Washington to be punished. But instead, he hands Ethan a pendrive with information and tells him to pretend to have attacked him and Brandt so he can escape in order to clean up this mess. Before Ethan can do anything, though, the car is found by the police, who open fire on it. The secretary and the driver die, causing the car to lose control and fall into the river. Ethan uses a flare together with one of the bodies to distract the officers while he and Brandt swim away. Sidorov is there too, overseeing the operation and he's been informed that two prisoners have escaped from their prison. One is obviously Ethan. And while Sidorov doesn't know Bogdan, he sends his men to get in contact with him. Meanwhile, Ethan and Brandt reach a train station and find a secret IMF bunker inside a departing freight train, where they reunite with Benji and Carter. Ethan wastes no time and, after making a secret call, connects the secretary's pendrive to find a speech by Cobalt where he promotes the use of nuclear weapons to clean humanity. He used the explosion at the Kremlin to cover up his theft of a nuclear device. Now he only needs to meet with Morau to get the codes to activate it. Intel says both Morau and Wistrom have been seen going to Dubai. So they need to intercept them. With the IMF out of commission, they won't have any outside help. Only the tools they can find inside this train. It's even more dangerous than usual. But everyone agrees to join the mission anyway. The team travels to the Burj Khalifa the highest building in the world. But to get their plan rolling, first they must take care of a small problem. Benji can't just hack into the hotel's system because the firewalls here are military grade, which means they'll have to access it from the outside. While Carter steals a waiter uniform, Ethan wears special gloves that allow him to climb up the outside of the building to reach the server room. It's a dangerous mission to do in a hurry since he needs to be done before the criminals arrive and the incoming sandstorm gets to the city. But Ethan manages to stay focused and reach the server giving Benji direct access to all cameras and elevators. The door of the server room can't be opened though. So Ethan uses a roll of wire to run down the outside of the building and swing back into the room while Benji begins working on changing the numbers of the rooms on two floors. Now they can begin working on the plan properly. Carter will pretend to be Morau and meet with Wistrom. While Brandt and Ethan will pretend to be the criminals and meet with Morau. Brandt's wearing a special lens that can capture and transmit images to the printer inside a briefcase. This printer will copy the codes and print them in a scrambled order on paper that can be tracked by Ethan's phone. At that moment, they see on the cameras Wistrom arriving with Lysenker, whom Brandt recognizes as the cryptographer who redesigned Russian codes during the war. This means he's been brought in to authenticate the files. Morau will sell them, which ruins the whole plan. Ethan thinks they should give Wistrom the real codes and catch him later. A plan Brandt is against until Ethan makes him realize they don't have much of a choice. To make matters worse, the machine that has been working in their mask suddenly breaks, so they'll have to rely on the hope that Morau has never seen Wistrom before. Fortunately, that's exactly the case. Wistrom believes Carter to be Morau. And Morau believes Brandt and Ethan are her buyers. Carter asks for the diamond payment in advance. And when Benji enters the room pretending to be the waiter bringing coffee, he steals it without the others noticing. Carter gives Wistrom the suitcase with the printer, which is locked, so she buys time by pretending to need to find the combination numbers to open it. Meanwhile, Morau has given the codes to Brandt, who pretends to be Lysenker to control them to let the lens send the information to the suitcase. By the time Carter gives Wistrom the combination, the printer papers are already inside, and Benji enters Morau's room to present her payment. Wistrom leaves with the papers killing Lysenker on his way out. Morau is happy with the diamonds, but when the agents are allowed to leave, she notices the lens in Brandt's eye and orders her bodyguards to kill them. Ethan beats up the bodyguards with the help of Brandt, who shows shocking fighting abilities for an analyst. Carter goes after Morau and engages in combat. As well she's supposed to take her alive in order to interrogate her for intel. But in the middle of the fight, Carter kicks Morau and accidentally kicks her out of the window. Meanwhile, Ethan goes after Wistrom. Sidorov finds him on his way out and tries to arrest him. So Ethan beats him and his men up before rushing outside to find the sandstorm getting closer. Using the app on his phone that is tracking the papers, Ethan follows Wistrom through the storm and jumps on him when he drives by, managing to scratch his face and ruin his mask, revealing him to actually be Cobalt. Ethan steals a car to try to follow him. But because of the storm, both of them end up crashing. 
and Cobalt manages to escape by jumping on a passing truck. The team relocates to an abandoned building. And while the team argues about Mora's death, Ethan contacts his mysterious caller again to arrange a meeting. He also confronts Brant to make him confess that he used to be an agent and ended up as an analyst, which explains his fighting skills. But Brant refuses to explain his past. It isn't until Ethan leaves to meet with his contact that Brant tells the others what happened. He was on a mission in Croatia where he was supposed to protect a couple without them knowing he was there. Unfortunately, he failed, and the woman was killed. This woman turned out to be Julia, Ethan's wife. Overwhelmed by guilt, Brant decided to stop doing field missions and stick to desk work. Which is why he knew why Ethan was in prison, he had killed the men that murdered Julia in cold blood. In the meantime, Ethan meets with his contact, who is none other than Bogdan. His cousin is the Fog, a powerful arms dealer who agrees to help Ethan because nuclear war isn't good for his business. The Fog informs him that the satellite Cobalt needs to activate the codes was sold to a telecom in Mumbai. He also agrees to share some gear and even a private plane with the team in exchange for Ethan hooking him up with some of his government friends. After Ethan is gone, the Fog calls Sidorov and tells him where to find Ethan. The team flies to India with a plan in mind. Carter and Ethan sneak into a party hosted by billionaire entrepreneur Nath who is the owner of the company that bought the satellite. Carter will try to allure Nath with her charms while Brant sneaks inside through the kitchen and enters a ventilation shaft wearing a special metallic suit. Benji keeps him floating with a special robot that carries magnets, allowing Benji to guide Brant through a tunnel to gain access to the computers that control the satellite. Carter manages to get Nath's attention and is invited to see his private collection of art, which results in them going to his room. Now they can't be seen. Carter beats up Nath and gets the server codes from him, but it's too late. Benji has lost access to the system because Cobalt and Wistrom are accessing the satellite from another company building. They've sent a virus to Nath's home system to stop Benji, and the codes are transmitted to a nuclear submarine with orders to shoot a missile at San Francisco. At least the virus gives Benji the opportunity to track Cobalt's location. So Ethan and Carter make their way there without knowing that Sidorov's also been at the party and is now following them. Unfortunately, heavy traffic doesn't allow them to get there in time and the missile is shot. However, Ethan refuses to give up. Now they only need to modify their mission. Their next objective is to gain access to the system to abort the warhead. When they arrive at the company building, they are seen by Cobalt, so he orders Wistrom to cut power while he runs away with the briefcase containing the launch control device. Carter enters the building as well, but Wistrom shoots her before cutting off the power and escaping. After making sure Carter is fine, they work on their next tasks. Brant goes after Wistrom and the power switch, while Benji works on restarting the system. In the meantime, Ethan follows Cobalt into an automated car park, which consists of multiple moving platforms across a dozen floors. At the same time, Brandy finds Wistrom and beats him up. A fight ensues between Ethan and Cobalt where the briefcase gets thrown around from platform to platform. When they are high enough, Cobalt decides to sacrifice himself to buy time and allow the missile to hit its target, which results in him grabbing the briefcase and jumping, dying as soon as he reaches the bottom of the park. There's no time for Ethan to run down all those floors, so he gets inside a car and jumps down as well, surviving the fall thanks to the car's airbag. Afterward, he rushes to grab the briefcase and abort the missile, but it doesn't work. This is because the team hasn't brought back power yet Brandt is losing his fight with Wistrom. Benji tells Carter what buttons to press to restart the system once the power comes back and goes looking for Brant. He shoots Wistrom as soon as he finds him, and Brant brings the power back, allowing Carter to turn on the system, and Ethan's constant pressing of the buttons finally cancels the detonation. In the end, the missile just hits the roof of a building before falling into the sea. At that moment, Sidorov finds Ethan and gets to see the briefcase which helps him understand that Ethan has always been the good guy and he was told the location on purpose in order to see who the real villain is. A few days later, Ethan is in Seattle having a drink with a fellow agent while telling him of his latest adventures. The team arrives then. So Ethan says bye to his friend to tell the team he would love to work with them again. Carter and Benji are happy to accept the new mission. But Brant refuses and finally confesses his failure to protect Laura. However, Ethan isn't bothered. He's always known who Brant is and he doesn't blame him for anything because Laura isn't dead. No person can be safe while dating an agent. So Ethan faked her death to set her free. The killing of her murderers had been part of the plan too. This allowed Ethan to be sent to jail and contact Bogdan to get the information about Cobalt the IMF was looking for. Now that he has a clean conscience, 
Brand agrees to work with Ethan again. Once the team is gone, Ethan leaves his table to gaze at a woman arriving at the harbor. It's Julia, who sees Ethan as well and waves at him before going on with her life. Afterward, Ethan listens to another recording from the agency to receive his next mission.